in the armies, the uh, sniper is not an MOS. Um, so it's a kind of an additional um, additional skill set to go through the school. Uh, and then there are specific jobs that are sniper jobs, right? Okay. Um, so when I first when I first went through AIT and everything, it was just as uh, an infantryman. So um, <clears throat> then when I came active duty, um, I my first duty station was up at Fort Drum, New York, which is a horrible, horrible place. Um, if you get a chance to go, just pass. Um, I, I say that the the unit was actually really good, but the the weather is just ridiculous. Um, so I'm I'm originally from Kentucky, and um, you know, so having four or five foot of snow on the ground was a, a big a big culture shock for me, you know. Um, but um, but no, over over you know, I spent about two years up there, um, and my platoon sergeant um, was actually used to be an instructor at, at, uh, the sniper school. And so I think, you know, in retrospect, I think maybe that was kind of an influence, um, on, on my decision-making process. So, um, I spent a couple of years in, in, uh, Fort drum and then I wound up moving down to Fort Campbell. And when I went to Fort Campbell, um, I basically, before I signed in, I went to the, uh, the scout platoon, um, and interviewed for a position there, um, got, got hired on for lack of a better term or selected and, um, spent a spent about, I don't know, a few months, six, nine months as a, as a scout before moving over to the sniper section. And once I moved over to the sniper section, I just kind of fell in love. Um, and it's, it's a weird thing um, for for most snipers I know that have that have done it for a long time. Um, you know, it's kind of the same story with with most of us. You know, we we find it through one way or another, and once you fall in love with that job, you know it's the only thing you ever want to do. Um, you know, realistically, I got kind of promoted out of of a uh, position. Um, and you know, that, that's rough. Uh, but, uh, I got lucky because I was able to go back to sniper school, um, you know, as an instructor and still remain in the community and everything else. And in a lot of ways, you know, I've, I've been involved in the community, even getting out of the army. So it's still a lot of, a lot of the instructors, you know, down there at one time were former students of mine, um, you know, people in that still talk a lot to, to people in that arena that are still active duty. So yeah, I want to maybe shed some light on something you mentioned there. And, and I'm, as I mentioned to you when I, when I approached you, I'm not an expert on much of anything, but so if I say this wrong, correct me, but I think something that's interesting that people might not understand about the military, unless you've, you know, got some amount of knowledge is that you can, you can have a job, right? So let's say, you know, any, I mean, for you, obviously you were, you were a sniper, so you can have a job and you can get to a point where you've been doing that job so long and so well that in the natural progression of your military career, you get promoted and then, you know, you're too valuable or whatever to be able to do that job anymore. And so and it's kind of an interesting thing you said that you got promoted out of it that people don't understand right. is that you can have a skill set and you can do a thing in the military and it can be your you know, your kind of your life. Um, but at some point you have to make a choice whether you continue having a career or you, you know, end with the job you love. Um, well, is that accurate? Of, yeah. And a lot of times you don't, you don't even have a choice really, you know, it's, uh, the army has a tendency to just move people around. Um, so you might get transferred to another duty station where that job is not open. Um, or there's, there's not that job. Right. So, you know, say that uh, you work at McDonald's and and you love making burgers, man. Like you become the best burger maker on the planet, and you know a, a manager leaves and they're like, "Hey, we need you to fill in as this manager," and then you do a great job as a manager, right? So you're still in that world of of flipping burgers, but you're you're not actually doing the flipping. 
Um, and then, you know, you, you just continue to go up the ladder to where now all of a sudden you're going to, you know, maybe a McDonald's in some other country where they don't have burgers. Right. So you're like, well, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm still doing what the, the, the corporation, you know, wants me to do. And I'm still trying to do it as best as I can, but I really, I really want to flip burgers. You know what I mean? <laughs> so it's, 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 it's very similar. I think a lot of the, a lot of the problem is the, the translation, right? So, yeah. um, a lot of things in the army or, or, or the military are, are similar to the civilian world. They're just, uh, they're explained different. Um, so a lot of people have a, a hard time understanding them and, we as military folks do a really horrible job explaining <laughs> in civilian terms, um, you know, what, what we're actually talking about. Yeah. And I, you know, this is kind of a tangent, but I know something that you're passionate about and it was, you know, on your, on your season of alone, you talked about quite a bit was, was veteran resources and help for veterans. And, and, you know, I think unfortunately that difficulty translating, um, it also extends into translating skill sets and everything else. And it's kind of part of the challenge. I think that some of our, our veterans face. Um, so that's, oh, it, it, yeah, it, it absolutely does. And I, I think, I think if there was, if well, I had, to, I'd hate to say if there was only one thing, but um, I think one thing that, that the military could do a whole lot better is as guys are getting out or girls are getting out, um, is to give them realistic expectations of how their skills transfer. Right. Mm -hmm. So I think that that's a big thing because you, you feel lost a lot of times and, and alone because you only know how to trans, you only know how to translate those skills into military terminology. Right. So as an 11 Bravo, as a sniper, as you know, all this stuff, right. I get out of the army and it's very easy to think to myself, well, I'm just good at, I'm just good at being really sneaky and pulling a trigger. Right. <laughs> so like, what am I going to do in the civilian world? Right. But what, what a lot of, what a lot of guys getting out don't understand is, you know, me as a, as a senior E7, right. As, as, um, you know, getting out, and, you know, I had 40, 50 people underneath of me, right? I had not just to account for their date, for their work life, but for their every, every waking moment life, right? So those, those skills and from a management perspective, like that's, that's almost transferring into like company ownership. You know what I mean? Like, there's very few people in the civilian world that have 40, 50 people underneath of them yep. and that are, that are in charge of that type of management. Right. So even a, a younger guy, you know, say a, a young sergeant getting out as a team leader, you know, you have four or five people underneath of you. That's management now in the civilian world, you know? And I think, I think a lot of times it's, it's not, it's a translation issue, yep. you know, it, it, and they, a lot of people don't understand how to translate the skill sets that they've actually learned, you know, not just, you know, crawling around in the mud or not just pulling a trigger or not just doing this, but you know, your, your critical thinking, your, your drive, your, your ability to, to accomplish tasks and accomplish them well without guidance. You know what I mean? There's a lot of people in the civilian world looking for those skill sets. And, you know, it's, uh, there's, you know, I think there's a lot of people now starting to hire veterans, you know, because of that, you know, they, they understand that, that, that there's a lot more to offer than just, you know, what's on their resume. Yeah. Instead of, instead of, Hey, I was an infantry team leader for, you know, four years or whatever it may be. I'm a skilled leader that works well under high pressure. I can adapt right. to evolving and rapidly changing situations and, you know, X, Y, and Z. I think, I think that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, that, that, that actually sounds, you want to write my book? <laughs> that sounds good. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll put that together for you. Um, 
we'll we'll throw that in for an extra five bucks. How about that? <laughs> that sounds perfect. Um, so with with sniper training, um, you know, I I've obviously never been through that. Do I, I've seen some things and, and understand that there's some very intense training that you go through. Uh, you mentioned being sneaky, right? Um, with your sniper training, is there survival class that comes into the sniper training? Did they put you guys through seer school, which for those that um, aren't familiar, so seer is basically the military survive, evade, resist, escape um, survival school that they put pilots, special operators, other people that are going to be in certain situations through. Um, what did that look like for you all? So it's it's actually funny, you know, you mentioned that. So um, SEER school, I, I, I was not able to attend. And one of the reasons is it is, it as you said, it's it's primarily for special operations, AVA, you know, uh, pilots, stuff like that. Um, now people that are in, you know, certain units, different things, um, you know, in the, as we say, conventional army will sometimes get an opportunity to go to SEER school, but it's, it's kind of rare. Um, and it's kind of, it's kind of hard to get a, a slot for school. Right. Um, and so at the time that I went through sniper school, um, there was almost nothing as far as survival whatsoever like there was there was nothing right i think we had like a powerpoint presentation that lasted half an hour on tracking that that was it right (laughs) and so that was one of the things like when i became an instructor and i don't i don't know how they're doing it now but when i became an instructor that was one of the things that i really took to heart um and made sure that it was at least at least a day included in the curriculum right Um, and, and, you know, that was just a day, but it was at least something. And so it was my, one of my interests or my, my interest level in survival and tracking and all these things actually came out of that, but in a different way than people would think, right? It came out of a absence of that training and a, and seeing the necessity for that training, right? So as a sniper section leader, I, you know, I had eight, eight guys underneath of me. Um, and I was in charge of, of the sniper section for my battalion. And so I needed survival training for my guys. I couldn't get any seer school slots. You know, I couldn't, you know, get anything of that nature. So what I did was I made friends, uh, with my battalion chain of command and I convinced them to allow me to go out and find a civilian instructor to come in and teach us this stuff, right? So I, I made them understand why this was necessary, why, why it was important, and the fact that we weren't able to get it through the Army system, right? So I, got, I wound up uh, getting a hold of a gentleman named Kevin Reeve, um, who's still teaching, by the way. He teaches uh, his school is on point tactical tracking. Um, and <clears throat> that was, you know, other than, you know, just doing random stuff, that was my first kind of real, um, you know, big push into the survival stuff. And uh, I wound up going up to, to one of Kevin's courses, absolutely loved it. I uh, just went by myself as a, you know, to kind of fill them out, see what was going on and um, absolutely loved it. And then I wound up bringing him down um, to teach a combination tracking and survival course um, for my section. And, you know, it was it was awesome. Um, but uh, that kind of started the ball rolling on the survival side. You know, I got I became a lot more interested in it. I became a lot more um, inundated with, you know, a lot of that stuff and started practicing those skill sets a lot more. Gotcha. And I think you might have, have mentioned this, but has the has the training changed today? Do do they get, you know, what does that look like for someone who's going through sniper training today? Yeah, it, it it's, it's a constantly evolving thing. I think, um, you know, it, the, the course has changed, um, from my understanding. I'm not, I, I can't speak a hundred percent to the nature of the course, but 
for multiple um, reasons, I'm sure. <laughs> well, I mean, it, there's there's a lot there's a lot of different weapon systems. There's a lot of different you know yeah. different things. Um, you know, one of the I, I actually um, I, I know the guy that's the NCOIC down there now. Absolutely great dude. Uh, so I, I I can say that if there are anything if there are things that um, aren't up to aren't, aren't up to snuff or, or have you know fallen by the wayside that he's the guy to fix it so um, I'm I am uh, extremely optimistic uh, about uh, about that but you know it, it is you know things uh, things need to change one of the one of the things that I'm actually offering not to get into a sales pitch but one of the things I'm actually offering you know for military and law enforcement is an advanced field craft course um, and what I have noticed in, in the realm of snipers, um, and just, you know, the military at large is there's a lot of emphasis put on technology. There's a lot of emphasis put on, you know, this, that, or the other thing. And a lot of the, a lot of the lessons that, that were learned before my time, during my time, um, are, are all but forgotten you know, as far as, as far as field craft, as far as, you know, being able to be sneaky, you know, for lack of a better term, but, um, and then not even to mention, you know, the, the stuff that was around hundreds of years ago or thousands of years ago. Um, you know, so one of the things that I hope to do with that course in particular is be able to kind of have a revival of, of a lot of those, those skill sets and to show them, you know, how important these things are still today on a modern battlefield. Um, because, you know, I, I, I tell people in, in that world all the time, you know, um, guns are going to change, you know, technology is going to change since the beginning of warfare. There has always been, and there will always be a need for individuals who are sneaky. I, there, there is bar none, you know, that, that will always be a need. So, um, I think that uh, I think it's important to hold on to those skill sets, and I think it's important to to not let them get um, glossed over by the the advance of technology. Yeah, well, in a little bit here, I hope we'll get some time, or we will make some time to talk about what you're doing now, and and we can share uh, where you're at. Because I wanted to get into that, and as you were talking. Uh, the the light bulb started clicking of like ah you know Justin's Justin's a couple steps ahead of of your average person here so smart thinking on that end and uh, it's interesting you you mention you know these skills and and obviously this evolves right I'm sure that that coming out of the you know the 60s and 70s that that the military schools were very different and there's probably a lot more survival based on the theater and and how right. we had to operate in that theater. Right. And then as we've progressed, you know, I, and, and, uh, I, I, I recognize that, that right now, um, the Middle East and specifically Afghanistan is, is a, is a topic. <laughs> it, it, that's a, a light way to put it, but you, know, you look at, at that theater of operations and, and, you know, you might have someone who's sitting on a building for a couple of days and then a week later he's getting dropped off in the mountains with, you know, a, a small group of people. So that kind of presents an interesting challenge, not only for training, but also for keeping yourself prepared for a, a, you know, two completely different operations, I would assume. No, absolutely. And and I think that's been one of our, I don't want to say mistakes, but it's been one of our mistakes as, as a military is that we, we perpetually focus on the war that we're in. And what we don't do very well is, get a really good baseline of, of skill sets that we need and then flex for the war that we're in. Right. So we, we totally focus on Iraq or we totally focus on Afghanistan and, and you know, we're stuff falls by the wayside. Right. So when you, when you do have a war, that's not in a desert, you know, or, or not in, you know, mountains or whatever, then you got to relearn all those lessons where if you would have just kept the baseline, and I think we just do that as humans, you know, um, you know, if you would have kept that baseline and, you know, kind of, kind of just flexed for that period of time. And then, you know, you're, you're able to write the ship a lot faster. 